Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Um, we're going to go through the microblock system from tip to tail and then at the end uh, talk to you about how it uh, integrates with the grid and about net metering programs and things of like that. Uh, we'll be open for questions all the way through although you can't uh, pose them over the audio unfortunately you have to uh, type your questions in. You'll see in your little control panel that you have a section to type in uh, your question, then Cameron will pause us and uh, pose the question. So feel free to type those in at any time as we're going along and don't be afraid about interrupting us. We don't want to miss out on your important question. If you do miss something, you know, by all means you can phone us later on and uh, pose the question then. <clears throat> so going on, uh, over to you Douglas. Um, okay, hi everybody. This is Brian Douglas. Um, the, just the overview of this uh, webinar is going to be the microblock systems, um, focusing on this microblock kit on uh, net metering systems across Canada. Um, this is our microblock kit, which includes uh, solar panels, uh, microinverter, racking, and cabling. Uh, it's designed to be easy to quote, easy to sell, and easy to install. It's also net metering compliant with your local power company. Um, and we're going to take you through uh, the full sales cycle. Um, and Ed's going to start you off uh, at marketing. So go ahead, Ed. OK. Uh, with any um, good sales, it starts off, of course, with uh, marketing. And the whole purpose of marketing is lead generation. Uh, this is where a lot of people make mistakes. And that's why we wanted to go over it. You know, we get to see. Um, those mistakes throughout our dealer network. Um, so just to touch on a few things that you should consider, we're going to go over who you're trying to um, sell these systems to. And grid tie in particular is a little bit different than some of the markets you may have been dealing in. Uh, what should be your message? Avenues for delivering that message. That's the most common one where the mistakes are made. And how we can help you out doing that. Most people, when they go to advertise and market, um, you know, they do the shotgun approach. They just fire out a whole bunch of things and just see what happens. Well, you should actually do it very carefully or you can end up wasting a lot of money. So the first thing is, is who uh, the customers are so that you understand how you're going to develop the message. Um, there's the financial customer. Um, one of the things that I just looked on my bill and for BC Hydro, um, the rates have gone up 40% uh, since 2008. And, you know, that's quite a hike. And they just announced today they're going to go up another 17% over the next three years. When people are looking at, uh, you know, the future, um, you know, usually they look and they estimate, okay, you know, hydro rates are probably going to go up between 3 and 5% a year. And, you know, that's how they make their calculations. Well, in actual fact, they're going up between 8 and 9% every year. So that's something to point out and to note uh, that those customers are out there and how to attract them. There's technology savvy customers. So, you know, just interested in new gadgets and different ways of doing things. And one of those could be producing your own power. Uh, the biggest one is, of course, the environmentally conscious. Customers who are thinking about the future, you know, their kids, their grandkids. You know, it's people in that sort of segment that you want to attract. What is your message? Um, so when you're developing your message, again, you should know your audience. So what we just talked about, um, knowing your own business and what your capabilities are, your strengths, your weaknesses, um, what that would be. So define your business strengths, niche in the industry, how you can apply those to your clients. So an example of that could be produce your own green electricity, you know, hire a local installer, sometimes talking about, uh, you know, the fact that you're a local. So, you know, for us, you know, Victoria or Barrie, you know, that's where we would be saying, okay, you know, you in Victoria that want to produce your own power, contact ATS, da, da, da. We don't do that, of course, but that would be an example of that. Avenues for delivery. Now, again, I talked about this as where most people um, make a mistake and the, the main things that you need to consider is is branding so getting your company name prevalent so people will see an ad and they remember it you know I always look at ads I see on TV on buses or things like that 
where I see the ad and there's a really cool uh, picture and the ad grabs my attention, but then the bus goes by and I have no idea what the ad was about or who the company was or anything like that, but it was a cool ad, but I didn't get the branding. So that's important. Um, the longevity of an ad is a very important because you know, you're know you paying out some money and that ad might not have a uh, long lasting. Magazines are a good example of that. Uh, they don't last very long and they actually can be quite expensive. So the first and easiest way to start is a website. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's phone book, yellow pages, can pages. These are long la lasting but they're expensive but you also now do get a free web listing for that and they come up quite often on search engines so not bad especially for your local area. Publications and magazines, we don't recommend this because, you know, uh, depending on the size of your company, these are very expensive um, and they have a short shelf life. Once the magazine cycle is done, your ad disappears unless you renew it. TV and radio are, are good because you can usually get free segments, especially with solar right now. It's so high in, you know, the media's eyes that uh, it's easy to get um, free clips on what you're doing, especially if you do a demo system. Any demo system that you're doing, you should contact your local radio and TV and get some free advertising out of it. Mail outs, uh, we have opportunities where we can do mail outs uh, via Canada Post, where we can even target um, certain households, incomes, things like that, areas and stuff like that. So they're quite good because you can get out to you know, your accurate market. <clears throat> Train of shows, seminars, word of mouth, and handouts are all good. Um, you have to be careful with trade shows because some of them can be quite expensive, and you may not get the uh, the market you're looking for. You know, a lot of people will go and set up a booth in their local home and garden show. Well, that could be filled with anybody. You know, not necessarily people who are interested in in solar. So you can end up with a lot of people just kicking tires. And Brian's going to go over that a bit. <clears throat> and trade shows can be quite expensive. How we can help. Um, so we, we do this quite often um, with a lot of our customers. And if you haven't done it, just contact us and, and see what our options are and what we could do for you specifically. Some of the examples are as websites. If you don't have a website, you at least should have a single page website so someone has somewhere to go. Um, handouts, we have handouts where we can brand with your logo. If you don't have a logo, we can design a logo for you. Um, web optimization, so if you have an existing site but you aren't getting very many hits, we have a number of different ways of increasing that. Um, and then if you do decide you want to go to a show but you don't have a lot of gear and don't want to spend a whole bunch of money on getting you know, making these pop-up banners and stuff like that. We will loan you um, uh, pop-up banners, you know, some stuff, some gear to display and stuff like that to help you out with that show so you don't have to fork all that out. So an example of this, um, Brian's going to be our um, representing our dealer. So this is uh, Brian's House of Solar. So if Brian contacted HES and said, hey, Ed, you know, I really like that Microblocks webinar you put on the other day, and I really want to get into solar. What do I do? And I'll say, well, the first thing is, is, you know, a web page. We can build you a quick and simple landing page for Microblocks if that's what you're targeting. You know, have a good message and then, you know, do that quite economically for you. And then we can also do an optimized web listing where we get you some immediate hits for your local area. You know, and, and, and optimized web listings are really great because you can actually have it so that, say, someone Google searches solar and they're in Victoria, you know, you get a better ranking because you're only targeting customers in Victoria. And we're glad to help you out with that if you want to give us a shout. Uh, it's really low cost. Um, you'll be surprised. Uh, we do it quite cheaply. Um, and that's just to help you out. It generates really good leads. It's a good business card, which means it's um, something you can direct people to. Everybody wants to see your website, um, you know, so when you go and visit a customer or talk to them about it, it's easier just to give out your website as your business card and say, hey, go have a look and see, and then contact me if you have any more questions. And then it's easy to build off of. It's easy to update. It's easy to change. 
as your business grows and changes. And trust us, our website is uh, a constant project and changes almost every month. So once you've done all your marketing and uh, you start generating leads, uh, it's time to qualify them. And I'm going to pass it back to Brian to walk you through that. Yeah, you bet. Um, as Ed was touching on, uh, solar's all over the news and internet, and uh, a lot of people want to take your time to educate themselves. Um, and we're going to go over a few ways to try to avoid this. So um, tire kickers and info sponges, those are guys that um, will take up a lot of your time and won't get you any sales. Um, another big mistake of new clients is designing every system before you even know the client's budget or expectations. Um, some people will be buried in system design, making sure that it will fit on the roof, yet the guy has no budget and, and is just just looking for um, more of that information that we're trying to uh, pull out of you. So uh, the goal is to narrow your leads down and uh, obtain the high-end clients that are actually going to uh, be doing some of the projects and moving ahead on uh, installation and sales. Um, so in the lead qualification, um, we want to figure out how uh, interested they are and how they actually got a hold of you. Uh, not only does uh, figuring out how they get a hold of you help with the marketing that Ed was talking about, it, it lets you focus on what was working. So um, if you have a, 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 ma a magazine, or sorry, not a magazine, but a small little uh, ad in a newspaper uh, in a cottage community or something like that and it's bringing in a bunch of leads and it costs you 50 bucks, you might want to keep going back to that. Um, but it can also, uh, figuring out where they found you, it can also help you avoid uh, internet scams and uh, figuring out that these are actually legitimate customers. Um, so you'll need to find a way of qualifying uh, these leads. So having a question and answer page or a FAQ, uh, FAQ on your website um, can actually help you um, filter these guys that are just there looking to get your information um, and to, to be an info sponge. Um, people love to chat about solar, so if you have a place where you can ask them if they've read their web page, um, you can send them there um, to get them educated instead of having to say the same thing to the same people all the time. Um, another thing for qualification, it's kind of the opposite of what they do in the, the car world is you actually tell them their costs are going to be in the $10,000 range for a, for an eight panel system, uh, lower for smaller systems, but at least get them to terms if they're clients with not a lot of budget, um, they, they might not be the customer that wants to proceed. They might have, have expectations of being able to put $500 down and save $500 a month. Um, so getting that information out of the way right away is good. Um, discussing how much room they have on the roof. Um, again, they might have a north facing 10 square feet to work with and they expect the world. Um, Google Maps will help. Just get their address, throw it into Google Maps and you can have a look. Um, and ask them for their estimated lead time, see how long they're expecting it to take uh, for you to do the install because it, it will be a, a process with going through uh, application and um, getting the product in an installation. Um, so here's, I put together a list of the frequently asked questions of people that called in and I'm going to touch on some of them. Ed will get to the rest of them throughout the presentation, uh, but the ones we want to focus on are uh, how much does an average system cost, how much space does it take up, life expectancy, uh, the myth of the sunlight myth that we have throughout Canada, um, and how much power it's going to actually generate or save. So the first topic is the average system cost. Um, easy ballparking is throwing the $5 a watt installed cost. Uh, we've seen lower, but this is just a good starting point for letting the client know um, what their expectations are, are going to be. Our Microblox kits list at $1,909 retail for our Microblox 470 kit. Uh, that would um, get us to that range once it's, once it's installed. The other uh, question we're talking about is how much uh, room does it take up on the roof? 
You can, again, with Google Maps or if they have a rough drawing of their roof line, we have uh, a, a little toolkit that you can put microblocks onto graph paper uh, that will let you know how many microblocks you're going to fit on that particular roof line. It, it actually helps a lot. So the 10 watts per square foot or um, inversely 100 square foot per kilowatt is the math on how much room solar will take flush on a roof roof line. See on this, actually, I'm going to get back. On this application, we see that we have um, eight on the top and 10 on the bottom. So we have 18 microblocks are able to fit on this roof line using our, our square footage um, estimate. And that's what's able to budget for the system. So life expectancy is another common question. Uh, there are panels uh, that have been around for uh, well over 40 years that are still producing um, in, in manufacturing. Um, they, they're obviously lower efficiency than the new ones, but there's no moving parts, 25-year uh, warranties on the product, but you do have to make sure that you're buying from a company that is going to be around for the 25-year warranty. There's plenty of companies that boast, boast a 25-year warranty that aren't going to be here in the next two or three. So that, that's one thing to keep your eye open um, about. But the, the panels themselves are, are fairly robust. They're all tested um, to um, high quality testing, make sure that the glass is, is strong. And yeah, we, it's not normally the panels that fail in a system. They're the least likely um, item to fail in a system. Uh, here's a big uh, big thing that everybody talks about is that Canada doesn't get enough sun. Uh, it's actually the opposite. Germany is the world leader um, and we have 30% more sun than they do. Uh, our uh, Japan behind that and we're, we're still well above what they have for sunlight. You see Canada stacks up um, fairly well across, uh, across the, even the American markets that are booming. Um, our microblock 470 will generate 595 kilowatt hour a year. Um, in I think that data was from Kelowna, but that's a pretty common number across Canada, depending on where you are. Um, and the potential is is a lot better. So when someone tells you we don't have enough sunlight, um, they're they're just incorrect. Um, so the other question you'll get is how much power am I actually going to be generating with this kit? So as I said in the last slide, each microblox uh, generates 595 kilowatt hours per year, uh, which is works out to 1.7 kilowatt hours a day, which can be, depending on the home uses, the usage is roughly 5% of your um, annual use. So if you want to go to four of the microblox kits, you can produce 20%. Uh, it'll just depend on what the user's um, end goal is for their power consumption savings. Um, you'll get a lot of, uh, lot of what I call non-customers that I'll call in. Um, biggest example is that uh, they are underfunded. They'll call in with $1,000 in the bank expecting to go off grid, which surprisingly happens more than, more than you would expect. Uh, so you want to figure out if they have a budget within that 10 grand range to get something in the 20%. If they don't, I mean, you can go lower, but we just want to figure out that they are actually willing to spend some money and aren't expecting like a quick fix to, to all their financial problems via solar. Uh, the other customers that will call in will say, I want to take my house off the grid because power costs too much on the grid. Uh, it's just not going to work that way. They have to buy a big battery bank that has to be replaced in best case scenarios every 15 years, um, which it, it in and of, of itself can can make it uh, intrusive. If, if it was off the grid, it, it'll make more sense because you got to bring power lines out or uh, things like that. But in the city, if there is grid, you should use the grid. Um, another customers are asking for designing your system and getting every single piece priced out. Um, when they're asking for a price on every single light, line item, they're probably shopping you. Um, and then the final customers that are just looking for return on investment, um, tell them to move to Ontario because that's about the only place that has um, a, a very quick ROI. There's still return on investment on the product. Um, it's just if they're looking for a, a six-year return on investment, it's, it's just not 
where the solar industry is at. So, um, so this is an example of a call that comes in. Uh, so this is Brian's House of Solar. How may I help you? Oh, hi. I was uh, just on your website. Uh, very good website, by the way. I don't know who built that for you, but excellent website. Um, and I'm curious about going ahead with one of these uh, solar systems. Not sure what they cost or how I go about it. Um, well, the typical system that will get you about 20% of your power usage would run about uh, $10,000. Is that anywhere near your uh, your budget range? or? Yeah, I was thinking about, you know, choices between heat pumps or some other things. So, yeah, I'm in about that range. Good. Um, and uh, what type of uh, roof space do you have to, to work with that on that system? Uh, I think it's it's about uh, 10 by 20, so I guess that's 200 square feet. Um, perfect. That would be in line with, uh, you, you can fit about 10 watts per square foot, so that would be about a 2 kilowatt system. So, yeah, that that would work on our our, our uh, kit of four of our microblocks there. And then what would I be uh, saving in power for my house? Um, each one of the microblocks is going to be offsetting 5% uh, of your home usage on average. Uh, we'd want to check your bills to verify, but that's um, the norm. So you'd be saving about 20% of your home energy. Oh, wow, that's very good. That's actually better than I would have been getting from any of those other options. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. What's the next steps? Um, so we figured out your budget, so we just want to figure out uh, where your site's located. So if you have an address uh, for your your ad, um, for your building, we can look it up on Google Maps and uh, just verify the roof line um, and then just figure out when you're expecting to uh, to go ahead with this project. Okay, can I email you at that address that was on your website? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, the sales at hespv.com. Excellent. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay, so, so once you've qualified that lead, now you're finally ready to go on to system design. As Brian mentioned, you don't design for everybody, and, you know, that is a very common mistake. You know, I've had people, you know, asking us questions about, you know, a layout on the roof and stuff like that, and when we turn around and ask them questions about the customer's budget and things like that, they have no idea. Um, we don't want to waste our time just as we don't want you to waste your time. So it's important to filter those down, make sure that you do have an actual real customer that is looking at doing, you know, a specific system, has a budget and a timeline. <clears throat> so now we'll move into the design stage. I'll just walk you through this step by step. So the first thing is, is the site assessment. Um, Depending on you know your range and how far you're you're spanning out or how close the customer is to you, it, it is better to go to the site, meet the customer. That gives them reassurance that one you're real, um, and then you get way better information out of that. So you can find a lot of information, and not a bad thing to you know look at Google and get a good shot and get an idea of which house there are before you know at least then you know which house you're going to as well. Once you do go to the site, of course, um, the roof space is one of the most important things. So measuring the roof, um, you know, looking for obstructions, so roof vents, um, you know, satellite dishes, uh, plumbing vents, all these sort of things. And a lot of them, unfortunately, end up on the nice south side of the roof. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, you, you know, it's worth it to even move. Um, some of those things and you know you can get a plumber in to move the vent to another side of the roof um, so that is possible so measure the roof draw in all the obstructions um, figure out what the slope is um, common slope is 412 pitch of course um, but could be varying so you'll need to know that if you want to um, estimate the exact power what type of covering is on the roof is important so um, it could be asphalt shingle, it could be regular shingles versus interlocking shingles, it could be a metal roof, um, corrugated metal, it could be standing seam. All these depend on how you're going to actually attach the roof. So you want to find that out um, when you're doing your site visit. There will be also shading. Um, so, you know, you look at the, the south stand on the roof and look towards the south and see what obstructions will um, impede the uh, performance of the modules. Um, these are very, 
good kits for that type of system, but it will affect, uh, affect what the customer is going to see when they start monitoring it. So you want to explain that up front. Um, you know, there are tools out there that you can analyze that and do it into the nth degree, or you can just simply take a picture of that south view and, you know, show them that, hey, this tree over to the west is going to, you know, block your sun in the evening, so you're going to see the power die off at that time, and that might be enough for your customer. <clears throat> the wire route, you have to figure out how you're going to get that down, breakers, spaces, service size, all this is important. Utility bill, you want to try and get a copy of that. You can look at their annual consumption in the year. If you get a year's worth of bills, you want to figure out who their local distribution company is or the utility is so that you can figure out what the interconnection rules are. And then for those, you know, the application that you send to the utility, you need their account number and meter number and all that kind of stuff. So you want to gather that while you're at site. <clears throat> the next stage will be is seeing you know, what exactly you could fit. Brian showed you how to estimate that so you could quickly um, filter out the customer. Um, the customer might not have been accurate in guessing of what the roof size was, so you want to re-verify that. And then you want to do a rough layout diagram. We actually have, you see up in the right-hand corner, we have um, pads that we can send you where you can actually sketch the roof and then see how many microblocks you could fit into that plane or you can just use a piece of graph paper and sketch it out yourself. We can help you out with these, uh, you know, once it is a real customer and, you know, it's progressing a bit, we can actually do layout diagrams for you and that'll help you um, to uh, install the system. Like I mentioned, the roof covering is important and this is why it's how you're going to attach the roof. So once you know what type you have, um, regular asphalt shingle, we have a flashing system that's used. Um, interlocking shingle is the one down in the bottom right hand corner. Um, we have ones for corrugated metal roofs and one for standing seam as well. What's the customer's goal? So this is really important to nail down and you know you don't want to design something that this customer does not want. They're going to get frustrated. Typically they reduce, they want to just reduce their energy whether it's for environmental reasons, financial reasons, or whatever it might be, that's what their goal is going to be. You want to find out how much. If they don't know, then uh, you can. What you can do is you can give them uh, estimates. You know, so say, okay, well, two of the microblocks is 10% of the average home. So if they don't want to give you all their bills and you actually calculate it out, you can give them the rough numbers. Uh, also, some customers want to net zero out specific loads. Or it's good for you to pitch this as a way and, you know, here's some examples. One microblox will actually cover off your the typical fridge's uh, consumption in a year. Uh, 42 iPads is another way of uh, looking at it. So it helps sometimes put things in perspective for a customer, right? So you're going to net out, you know, the use of your fridge or it would cover 42 iPads. One that's been taking off is... Um, the electric vehicles, um, people who are going to electric vehicles are very technology savvy and very environmentally uh, conscious. So putting solar that offsets their um, electricity for their car to, you know, within city driving is quite an easy thing to do. Also solar hot water, um, we know the thermal side of that, but you can also do that with PV with an electric hot water tank and net out the usage of a, a typical hot water tank. So the last part of the designing is now you've you've got how many you can fit on the roof. You've got um, uh, the roof material, so you know how you're attaching. You also know what the customer wants and what they want to see out of the system. So that's determined the size of the microblocks that you're going to put on. Now you have to figure out how you're going to connect that in. Um, so you're going to have to look at the wire run, how you're going to get from the modules on the roof, either into the attic or down over the eave or something, and get your wires from there down to the main electrical service. So you have to plot that out. We can certainly help you with that. We can help you with sizing that wire, what size it needs to be, um, what equipment you're going to need to be. You're going to need a disconnect switch. And you see that down. Some utilities uh, require a second meter so that they can um, record how much the solar is producing. 
um, some do not. So that's going to be a requirement of the utility whether you need a second meter or not. Um, you're going to need a, a breaker for the panel um, and then all the cabling in between. The probably the last step is once you've figured all that out and you start getting an idea of where your cost might be, um, you know you also have to design to the customer's budget. You know there might roof might be able to fit uh, 10 kilowatts, but you know as the example we had is uh, you know if the budget's only 10 grand, then there's no sense even proposing that. You want to propose something's within their budget, and there's nothing wrong with um, exceeding that a bit, and that's why it's good to do it with fixed cost and variable costs. So, for example, you figure out what it would uh, cost to travel to the site, implement all your safety, any rental equipment and all that, because none of that's going to change on the size of the system. The main breaker disconnect, the wire feed down, the permits, the interconnection, all that's going to stay the same. But then what you can say to the customer is, okay, here's your price that you wanted. It's within your 10 grand budget. It's for the micro box. But now you can add, you know, each micro box for less than two thousand dollars, and you look, you know, this is how your uh, production goes up. This is how much more you knock off of the percentage of your house, and it's only increasing um, by a small amount. And then you can upsell, but make sure you always uh, quote what they wanted in the first place. So an example of that, uh, you see the roof up in the right-hand corner. It's an asphalt shingle. 412 pitch, it's about 20 by 14, um, it's a 200 amp service, uh, 120, 240 volts, uh, there was lots of breaker space in the panel, and you're going to run through the attic. They owned a, an electric vehicle, so we had that in mind, and they had a budget of $10,000. This works out to be four microblocks kits. Um, you can see that the roof space in the drawing part there's lots more. We could easily fit probably another two kits, no problem, on that roof. But then that would have exceeded the customer's expectations, budget, what they wanted to see, do, and everything. So, you know, when you install that, you can make sure you install it with future expansion in mind and let them know that. Um, but it's make sure you um, design it accordingly so you fit all their criteria. We would have had a what we call the microblocks combiner box. That is a, a combiner box that helps you get into the attic space and get down. Uh, we would add monitoring um, because this customer wanted to monitor the system and see how their savings are going. And then uh, we had all the interconnection equipment designed for that system. So I know that's a, quite a brief view, but just understand that you know if this is your first time doing it. Um, we help customers on a daily basis with, you know, putting together design packages and can look at the, you know, roof you're looking at and give you any advice and make sure you don't miss something and lose your shirt, but also quote it so that you can win it. So now uh, on to that, quoting and closing, and I'll hand it back to Brian. Uh, okay, so we're going to go over um, how to close a sale, um, finishing and financing, and getting your contract in place. Um, so you got to know your product, um, start to know some of the product line. We've made it pretty easy um, by, uh, you want to go back a slide, Ed? Uh, we've made it pretty easy to uh, come acquainted with the Microblocks ones, so if you're going to um, be quoting the Microblocks kits. It's uh, it's a standardized kit. You basically just work off a spec sheet. Um, okay, go ahead to the next one. Sorry. So um, to understand our um, uh, basically quoting process, we need to know our basic costs. This was one of the um, frequently asked questions from my previous slide. Um, but each uh, Microblocks 470. Uh, sorry, that number is wrong. It's 595. Um, it gives you the dimensions of the microblocks and our list cost at uh, 1909 with the basic interconnect cost of 1500 but then there are a couple of the add-on costs so we can exactly what Ed was saying you can start off with a two thousand dollar installation cost and then two thousand dollars of microblocks and you're off to the races um, what are some of the add-on costs uh, there's the option of uh, microblocks monitoring 
uh, it's a lifetime contract with it. You buy a communications gateway. It uh, can monitor individual panel. So it can also tell you if one of the panels is underproducing or if there's a connection issue with one of the panels, it'll let you know. Uh, you can actually see what if on that screen on the left there, if one of those was blacked out, we would know that there was an issue with it. Um, you can go to site and see, oh, it's covered in snow. And so it, it's not an issue with the product. It's just happened to get a, a snow dump on that particular module. Once it melts, it's, it's back up and running. Um, the AC disconnect is required uh, between your, because your microinverters are producing um, AC coming out of the back of the panels, so you do need a lockable disconnect as per most uh, local LDCs will require it. And then Ed touched on that micro box combiner box. It's actually a very um, sleek looking, sleek looking combiner box on the roof. It looks like a, a roof vent, um, and it can slide under your shingles, and it, it just looks really clean for your installation, and it gets you right into your attic. Um, so most uh, when you're when you're going through the um, quoting process, um, a lot of people like to talk on site or at least have you seen on site if they're at work or uh, just just quickly so you can talk about oh that tree is in that location. They they really appreciate knowing their particular site. Um, the decisions uh, often involve uh, the wife and um, your the husband um, in the in the decision process, so make sure to include them both. Um, figure out what type of customer they are so you can touch on that particular aspect of the product. If they're a very green client, touch on the carbon offset or um, any of the uh, local power offset that you're producing for years. Uh, if they're a technical one, you can start talking about how many kilowatt hours and exactly what it's um, producing so so there's a there's different types of customers that you'll be uh, focusing on and they'll all want different particular pieces of information uh, we've, we've given you a bit of tools for trying to estimate on the spot once if we know how many square feet we can figure out how many watts we can fit and figure out how many dollars per watt for the install so um, estimating on the spot will give you a, a, a good reputation because they'll actually know that you know your stuff um, and then understand your products. Why would they buy from you? Um, what products, product lines you're carrying? Um, and just touch on some of the stuff Ed was talking about before, that you're local, you're knowledgeable, and um, you're, you're ready to do the install. Um, another way to protect your quotes from being shopped is um, give them a single line quote. Don't break out every single item in the quote. If they're asking for a breakdown of every single line item, uh, they're probably shopping you. Uh, everybody's got access to Google. Um, the, yeah, it, how I deal with clients that are asking for a breakout of a particular kit is I like to tell our dealers to tell them that I priced it as a kit. So if I break out every single line item, the cost of the kit is going to go up. And that generally stops it right there. <clears throat> um, and if they continue and want you to, to line price out every single line item, they're probably just wasting your time at that point. Um, so closing the sale, um, you're going to recommend a particular system. In this application, it was four micro blocks. Um, list of features. It's got 25-year warranty. Uh, we'll get it up in a day. Um, the, be prepared for some of the objections. Uh, some people are very um, miseducated by by reading stuff online. Um, so be prepared with some of the facts, like like we were talking about, uh, not enough solar in Canada. Um, if they have an old roof, it costs just as much to take it down and put it up. Uh, it's it's not really an objection if they're going to put a new roof up. Um, within five years, they can take the system off and put it back up fairly easily while they're doing the re-roofing. Um, then the other objections you'll hear is they just ran of this new technology that's coming out and it's going to make solar ten times more efficient. Um, Any time that those news launches come out, the product is a minimum of five years away from market and generally doesn't ever make it to commercial market because of cost. So uh, the new technology ones are a bit of a, a red herring in the industry because they never seem to come to fruition. I think people were talking about paint on solar about ten years ago and it's it's just not a not an option. Um, yeah, again, reiterate what your why the customer should go with you. Um, you know, stand behind the product. Um, go over the expected outs, output and when they're hoping to do the installation. 
Um, and also, I touched on it on the last slide, but definitely include the wife. Uh, there was an example of an installer who went over the whole system with a husband, had it all but sold, um, was where he was ready to sign on the dotted line. He called back just to verify a couple details and got the wife. Um, she asked a couple questions about the solar about the system, and the dealer said that he already went over it with the husband and could he talk to him instead? And uh, you can guess that there was no sale at that point. So yeah, just make sure that you uh, include the wife and um, let them know as much information as the husband as you're going along through it because they are generally the decision maker. Um, and to, to finalize a, a sale, um, just ask for the sale and ask if you can secure a deposit because a deposit is as good of a contract as you can basically get because they are not going to continue to shop once they put money down. So, um, yeah, going over the examples, um, basically your system price of the 1.88 kilowatt, just under our 10 kilowatt uh, threshold, uh, the power generation that it's going to do a year, uh, 25% or 20% of your home offset or like we we're talking about some of the electric vehicle driving um, make sure they know about the 25 year uh, warranty on the product uh, having a safety plan uh, during the quoting application is always a, um, a benefit for the homeowner and yourselves they'll they'll want to know that you have everything in line um, and discuss their payment plan and financing to make sure that you lock down the sale um, and so we're going to go back to Ed and he's going to take you through the uh, uh, installation process. So finally we've arrived. What a long process. But uh, in reality that's how it goes and it, it does take a long time before you get to the, the juicy stage which is the installing. Um, but now I'll just take you through that. So. Uh, first, it'll start with safety plans, permits, things like that. So we'll go through the roof work, home run cable, and then finally the inter utility interconnection. After that, they'll move on to how it works and a little bit more about net metering. Don't forget, as you have questions, just feel free to type them in and Cameron will pause me and, and ask away. So here's a, just a glance at the overall system. You can see it's you know connecting to the roof, assembles onto the rails, inverters onto the rails, and then finally the panels. So step by step, the first step is of course safety. Um, as Brian mentioned, it, it's good to have you know even if it's a one-page safety plan with just some you know overview, it shows the customer that you're thinking about safety. Um, you know, and if you say to the customer this is what we're planning to do you know here's the portion of the roof the solar is going on we plan to you know anchor um, up here and we're going to have safety ropes that are going to hang down just so then the customer as they see you working they aren't surprised at anything that they see and it just builds their confidence in you if you do that and then they have a competitive quote where the person hasn't even talked about safety there's a good chance that you'll win so once you get the site you put that safety plan into action uh, lots of different things that you should consider and cover in that. <clears throat> Once your safety plan's in, it's time to start uh, um, laying out the system and marking. So establish a staging area for the products and then mark out the array. Um, I've seen lots of sites where the person, one person measured it, it got drawn up, the project was delivered, you get the site and it doesn't fit. And I've even seen people start to install and then figure out as they're installing it doesn't fit. So when you're marking out the array, you mark out the outer edges to make sure that it's actually all going to fit on the roof. And you know, then you know, if all of a sudden you realize it doesn't fit or there's a vent in a way that needs to be moved, that can be discussed before you start drilling holes. <clears throat> So look at uh, where all the um, brackets are going to land up. Um, you'll see that from if we've supplied the drawing or if you've done the drawing, you should know where brackets and things are going to line up to see if you're going to run into any other problems. Once you've done that, it's time to locate the rafters. Um, you know, we've used a, um, a Bosch um, wall scanner, which works quite well. You know, there's the Hammer method. You can look underneath to see where the rafters are going to line up. Once you line up all the rafters, you can mark where you're going to put uh, the anchor points. And that might be a, a staggered pattern, depending on what you've come up with for the drawing. 
um, you mark those, you know, I usually steal one of my kids' crayons to do the markings on the roof. It works really good. Um, but you can use whatever you want. And then, you know, you're going to drill the pilot hole, inject sealant into the hole, um, and then anchor. And in this case, the flashing is used. But that's going to depend on your uh, roofing material. Tighten those anchors down, and then you're good to go on to the next step, which is laying out the rails. Um, depending on your layout and how long your layout is, you might have to splice a couple of rails together. We want the rail to be continuous throughout. It saves you uh, money and it saves you a lot of time. So you splice that rail together, you lay it out onto your anchors, and then you might have to mark and drill the holes to attach the rail to those anchors. Once you've attached the rails, um, you now need to adjust the height. Every roof isn't perfectly flat, and some, especially we find, you know, metal roofs, barns, and things like that can really have some uh, weaves and dips and things in them. So, the the racking and feet do have an adjustment to help you level that and to get it, um, you know, an approximate equal height across the rail. Once that's done, you need to run your ground cable. So all the rails need to be you know, connected together by a ground cable. Um, the microbox kit's really great because the, it actually includes the parts to uh, ground the panels to the rails, so you don't have to do it to every panel, but you do have to connect the rails together. Um, once that's done, you're ready to start installing your inverters. Um, your inverters will go on where each panel is going to be located and in the end, in the, behind the end uh, module. At that point, you move on to running your power cable, which is what connects all the inverters up. So that will run along your rail, and each inverter will plug into that power cable, and then it ends up at the end um, where it goes into a junction box or, as Brian talked about, that uh, combiner box, which you see in the bottom pictures, that can get you into the attic, and it looks nice and neat on the roof. Uh, we're probably going to actually have that available in black soon, too, so it will blend into the roof even better. Um, or you can have in the upper right-hand corner, you can have a picture where it uh, goes into a junction box or you can go through a weather head into the roof or down through the eave is another option on how you do that cable routing. You would transition the power cable that goes connects to the inverter. You have to have some way of transitioning that to the type of cable that you're going to use to run down to the main electrical service. There's lots of different options there. Here's a basic wiring diagram. You can see the microblocks are on the roof connected to the inverters. The inverter go into that power cable into a little junction box. And then there's the home run cable down to the lockable disconnect. And then it feeds into um, the main panel and out to the meter. Now your rails are installed, your inverters are on the rails, your inverters are all wired up, everything's done. You make sure everything's tight, then it's time to start uh, putting in the panels. You start with your first panel. You want to square your panels up to the shingles. Um, even though the shingles might not have been put on straight, it's what the eye is going to be attracted to. So when you're looking from the ground up at the solar array, your solar panels have to be in line with your shingles. So that's what you do for aligning your, your panels. And as you start with one, you may need to adjust as you go down the line by wiggling them a bit, either out or in with the mid clamps. Once all the panels are installed, your final steps are to complete the connection down to the main panel. So you can finish wiring that up, connect it into the main panel, then you'll go through commissioning everything to make sure oh, everything's torqued, there's no broken wires, everything's in place. You made sure you did all your grounding, you didn't forget anything. You have to post diagrams up, that's part of the electrical code. Uh, we do actually have a kit that can help you out. We can supply, you see down in the right hand corner, um, Lamacoid set of labels and a uh, single line diagram in Lamacoid. The diagram has to be posted uh, usually down by that uh, utility disconnect that we talked about. And then those uh, labels end up throughout the system. And we would we will supply you with a, a single line diagram, actually, that you can use as well so that you'll know where the labels are supposed to go. 
once all that's done, it's uh, time to get your system inspected. Uh, the safety authority will come in, inspect your system, um, then you'll pass your system expense um, um, test, and then you have to contact the utility again to let them know that you've completed your installation and you passed inspection, and that closes off um, your net metering application that you would have done with them in the beginning. Then the utility usually changes out your uh, revenue meter to a bi-directional meter. Most houses now, if the house is relatively new, will already have a bi-directional meter um, or even a smart meter. A smart meter is just a bi-directional meter with some communications on it as well. Once that all's done, you set up the um, monitoring and then you can hand it off uh, to the customer. And then you're away you're going. You're actually starting to net meter. So again, just to review the net metering process, depending on who your LDC, as we call it, which is a local distribution company or your utility, whoever's on your bill, um, whoever that is will have a different application process. Um, but in general, they'll have an application that you fill out, say, I want to put on you know, this many kilowatts onto a roof at this address, this existing account number, and uh, um, this is when I plan to have it complete. They'll review that application, tell you either you missed something or we need more information, and it comes back and forth a bit. Um, some of them want to see some diagrams and stuff like this, which we can help you with. Um, once they're happy with that, now you produce, they tell you to go ahead. You have to pull your permit, install the system just as we went over. Once that's all complete, usually you're sending back, um, sometimes it's photos of the site to show them what you did, as well as it might be the inspection certificate to show that you complied with the electrical code. Um, once all that's done and they're happy with how you did it, then they'll say, okay, we're going to go swap the meter and set up your billing. If you went and put solar on your roof and didn't tell them, they won't correct uh, your billing. So they won't, you know, no, one, it's illegal, but you also might not get credit for some of the power that's flown. Now I'll go over just a bit on how, how the power flows. So right. in this, yes? Hey, uh, just a quick question here. Um, what's the recommendation on spacing of panels from the edge and the peak of the roof? Ah, very good. Um, you know, and that's usually up to the municipality, so it depends if your municipality has um, specifications or not, um, but most don't because they're not used to solar yet. Um, but typically, uh, it's to a maximum of two feet, so 24 inches, or a foot and a half um, is what we've seen typically. Um, so I would say to be on the safe side when you're measuring the roof, make sure you leave uh, two feet out from all the way around the boundary on the outside. Okay, so back to uh, the net metering and how it works. So in this example, you see the fridge. Uh, let's pretend the fridge is only drawing 100 watts. And it's early in the morning. The solar array is producing 50 watts. That power comes down from the solar and goes into the house and offsets what the house is requiring. So now the uh, house only requires to pull 50 watts from the grid. So it's reduced the power consumption and is reducing how much you will be charged on your bill. That doesn't show up because, as you can see, the meter is only just sees that it needs less power. So your bill will be reduced, but it won't show up on your bill how much was in. Now, as the sun comes up and the ray is starting to kick out full power and it's producing 1,000 watts, that fridge only still needs 100 watts. So guess what happens with the access? It goes back through your meter and you start putting 900 watts back onto the grid. This shows up on your meter and you actually build up a credit uh, and that credit will show up on your bill and you'll get credit against what you're consuming on your bill and you only pay the net difference. That's why it's called net metering. So that outflow credit will appear on your bill and you'll get credit for that. And if there are any questions about this, you can either type in or you can email us later on. The monitoring side of it, so Brian sort of touched on this, but this is, you know, 
especially the tech savvy customers, they want to see this and the environmental customers, they want to see what's going on as well and like to see the numbers. And the good thing about the monitoring is there is different levels for everyone. There's an overview level and then you can dive down into as much specifics and reporting as you want. Um, it's quite simple to set up. Um, you just sign on to the web, enter the information of the equipment that you have, so you have to collect all the serial numbers of all the devices and things like that so that you can enter in so it knows specifically what it's looking at, where it's looking at. You build the array and then initialize it and monitor. We actually have an example of this on our website, so you can actually go and look and see what the, uh, the monitoring will look like. That's on our Microblocks webpage. Here's the, uh, an example of the overview, and this is uh, an example of the system that's on our, our, our rooftop. We have two microblock systems on our rooftop here in Victoria. Um, part of that is, you know, you can't really sell a product without walking the walk, so we put it, uh, put it on our roof to just to see how they'll perform. The, <laughs> I, I should probably change this picture out. I see the panels were, uh, I put up the, uh, the monitoring before the panels were actually connected. So I'm showing some of them aren't producing power. But that's the type of thing that you will see if there was ever a problem. You see that one that's producing zero watts, so you know something's wrong. Um, so at that time, it was actually just disconnected, and they're running fine now. But you get nice little snapshots. You see the uh, energy produced, and then they relate it to how many um, houses of energy you bought set. So that's the lifetime of the system. They also give you some carbon offset, so how many trees you're equivalent to. Kind of just a neat little quick at a glimpse graph to show you how well you're doing. So that sort of ends there. I don't know if there's any specific questions or if anybody wants me to go into any more details on any of the previous sections. Um, so Cameron, just let me know. Yep. Uh, hi, Ed. Uh, here we've got a quick question. Here uh, is anti-islanding built into the microblocks? Yes. Good point to bring up. Uh, um, it is built into the microblocks um, and it is covered and we do have all the documentation to support that. Um, the spec sheet does um, indicate that they meet uh, the inverter standards that most of the utilities want to see them meet. Um, there's three different standards. Um, the Canadian one is um, CSA 107.1. Um, UL 1741 is the US one and then they all comply to an IEEE standard of 929. Excellent. So if anybody else has any questions, uh, feel free to put them in um, right now while we've got uh, both Brian and Ed to answer them. Uh, we, or you can email them uh, after the call. So while we're waiting, if people are still thinking about what they might want to ask, I'll just go over some of the uh, benefits of microblocks. We have a lot of challenges. You know, here's a good example of a typical building that's being built. So these are residential homes, you'll see gables and all these different things where you're not left with a nice, flat, open, south-facing roof space. <coughs> uh, sometimes there's uh, lots of shading issues, so trees all the way around um, or different portions of the array. Um, roof slopes in different directions, you know, so normally some systems you wouldn't be able to use, utilize all those different roofs, but with microblocks you can. Um, no place to store the inverter, um, so we've actually had microblock systems go on ground mounts or pole mounts off, uh, you know, away from the house where you don't have a spot to mount the buffer. And of course, one that we're very familiar with is snow. Um, with some systems, when you get snow on a portion of the array, it actually stops the whole array from producing. The good thing with the microblocks is um, you only lose the portion that is covered with snow. The rest would continue to produce. So in this one, the ones at the top there that still have a little bit of snow in them wouldn't be producing anything, whereas the ones that are uncovered at the bottom would actually be putting out output. Hi, Ed. We've got a few more questions here. Um, sure. Is it necessary to change the hydrometer? The utility has to have a bi-directional meter. Um, one of the things is, uh, you know, the traditional analog meters with the spinning disk that you see, 
they actually can spin backwards. Um, so, you know, we've had sites that have had those meters and, you know, when you connect up the site and turn it on for the first time, you can actually see the meter slow down and then finally stop and actually start spinning in the backwards direction. The problem with those meters is they're not calibrated for selling power back, so they're not meant to run backwards. They will do it, but they're not meant to do that. Um, so the utility has to swap it out with something that can ro record power in both directions um, and that meets Measurement Canada's criteria. So that will be swapped out to a bi-directional digital meter. Uh, thank you. Um, a couple more here. Uh, one, I, I calculated the money back is approximately 10 to 14 years. Is this correct? Uh, it depends uh, where you are, whether you're BC Hydro or BCN, and what you used for your um, accelerated rate for the increase in that. So you would take your utility cost now, um, and then you would look at um, um, the uh, acceleration rate or how that the inflation rate of that utility rate. And like I said, you know, we're looking at uh, between. Um, uh, eight to nine percent and typically when we've done those calculations before we were using three to five so that's quite surprising but that does change from utility to utility but that you're in the ballpark range the other way of looking at it is um, um, the system that we have in this example we looked at that as to compare it to the utility rate and you can do that by say taking that um, ten thousand dollar installed cost um, over the warranty period, not even the life of the system. You take it over the warranty period, which is 25 years. The system's going to last a lot longer than that. Um, so you take that cost and you amortize it over that and look at the production. That particular system worked out to 17 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, BC Hydro, I know, charges now uh, 10 cents, 10.24 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's not that far off. And those, you know, the solar prices are continuing to come down, and of course the hydro prices are just continuing to go up. So eventually the two are going to cross over, which then it's just a choice of the customer. Which do you want to pay? Do you want to pay your utility, or do you want to generate your own? Cost the same. Excellent. Um, how about landscape or portrait? Uh, you mean in mounting configuration? Um, uh, you can do both. Uh, with the microblock systems, uh, it's easier to do it in, in portrait. And portrait is the most common. Um, but certainly when you're trying to fit as much as you can onto an odd roof space, sometimes switching the orientation helps you fit a few more modules. Uh, and we can certainly help you with that. And you know, if it's non-conventional, will help you figure out a parts list on how to mount a specific roof. So just let us know, you know, this is my goal. The customer has an infinite budget, so they don't care how much it costs. They just want to maximize how much they want to fit on the roof. You want to make sure that that is the case. You know, you don't want to try and squish in 30 panels when they can only afford four um, and waste all your time. If their budget is only, you know, that they have, you know, $7,000, then you know, design it around that. Save yourself some grief. Okay, and we've got one last question here. If anybody else has any, now's the time to get them in. Uh, like I said earlier, though, you can feel free to email or call us. Um, do you know if there's any charge is from Hydro to change out the meter? It depends on your utility um, and where you are in Canada. Um, it varies from utility to utility. Um, we did actually uh, a cost analysis from utility to utility and uh, um, found that you know there was quite a variance um, going between them. Um, Ontario has gotten very expensive and they're charging you around uh, 1200 bucks um, to connect which includes your meter swap boat and everything like that. Um, I don't know why it's so high because the meter itself isn't you know that expensive. Other utilities, we've th seen a $300 meter swap out. Um, BC Hydro was the leading utility for net metering um, where they have zero fee. Um, so th there's no connection fee whatsoever, um, no application fee, and no meter swap out fee. 
Okay, that looks like everything. So, uh, Ed, Brian, thank you very much for uh, your presentation today. Well, thanks uh, for everyone for attending. And yeah, it looks like we kind of made one on time this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and again, don't be afraid to contact us, whether it's marketing, design, supply, whatever you need. You know, we live and breathe this stuff on a daily basis, so you don't have to research it all on your own. We're here to help and happy to do so. So thanks a lot for attending uh, this. If you fell asleep or missed a piece of this webinar, we'll put it online so that you can view it over and over until you have it all memorized. Okay, good luck.